Chapter 3 By the time Noah come in from the pump, we pretty nearly had supper on the table. Cass was good help if you could keep her mind on it. She could cook water ground meal and make clabber milk and bone a mudfish as well as Mama herself. She knew her herbs, too, what they seasoned and what they cured. She knew her black root and golden seal and lady slipper and prickly ash and where to find them. Cass took charge of the chickens, too. They lived penned up on the other side of the house. Chickens and me didn't get along. If I had to keep them, I'd as soon not eat them. But Cass had a hand with the fowl. She named them, too, every chick of them, before they feathered out. Mama said better not name anything that you're fixing to eat, but Cass did. She went right on naming them under her breath. We thought we ate pretty good. Noah was right smart to kill game, squirrel and par prairie chickens, and in the fall, before it wintered up, possum. Quail, pheasant, ducks. We baked corn dodgers and fried meat in the fireplace. But white beans, gristle, and cornmeal mush got us through the darkest part of the winter. Here in April, we were still weeks from anything out of our garden. Oh, you can't picture how we lived back then. There wasn't but a string latch on the door, and we didn't have a stove of any description. I'd never seen one. We kindled fires with flint and steel and cooked over an open flame in the kitchen. We baked in a Dutch oven set into the bricks beside the hearth. In the winter, we lived in this kitchen to keep warm. That's how it was with us. We didn't know any better. Noah hung Pa's fowling piece with the pouch and the shot back in the chimney, on the chimney. Mama wanted him to sit at the head of the table in Pa's chair. It was to remind Noah that he was all the man this family had. We turned back our sleeves and fell to our supper. Mama had seen Cass's red, swollen, staring eyes. Noah was himself silent. Most times he could make a tree seem talkative. I heard a distant rumble, rumble over the river and hoped it was thunder. Long before people began hollering war, Mama was already afraid she'd lose Noah. Most boys hankered to go down on the river. They'd hang around the house, the landing, wanting to be taken on as roustabouts. They dreamed their boy dreams of being steersmen, which was what apprentice pilots were called. They'd have settled for being strikers, wiping down the metalwork with oily rags. The names of the boats swam in their heads. The Great Eagle, the Jubilee, the Neptune, the Rowena, the Fashion, the Vesuvius, the Arkansas Star. What a worry this had always been to Mama. A darker cloud gathered over her last Christmas. Last Christmas time was South Carolina seceded from the Union. They'd get the Cary Cairo City Gazette down on the landing only a day or so late. We weren't backwoodsy people who still didn't know Lincoln was president. The minute Mama heard that the cotton states were seceding, she feared anew for Noah. Then this month, when little Napoleon Bonaparte, then this month, when little Napoleon Beauregard fired on Fort Sumter and Charleston Bay, the whole sky darkened. Another week, and Lincoln had proclaimed his blockade of the southern ports. Now he was calling for 75,000 volunteers to fight. Mama couldn't spare Noah, but she couldn't forbid him much longer. Him and me would be 16 in the fall. He was a good boy, steadier than Pa, but he was restless as a riderless horse. We ate our meal by the light of the kitchen fire. Mama looked up once, stole a glance at Noah, but he was only a dark, broad-shouldered shape against the crackling fire. It was big doings that night, a dance in the room over Roger's stone store. This was the first such gathering of the spring. A fiddler was in from Cobden and Mr. Chilly Atterbury to do the calling. We wore our other dresses, the Lindsay ones we tried to save back. Noah wore an old black coat of paws, and he was lost in it. We went, though. Everybody in the district who wasn't tied to the bed or locked in the attic went. Everybody would be there bar the riffraff who lived around the ruins of a still south of town. Mama thought we ought to make a showing. She didn't want people talking behind our backs. She didn't want talk against Pa or Cass. Mama had her pride, though she said herself that pride could hollow you out. Grand Tower was only a settlement in them days, somewhere between a landing and a town. They hadn't gotten around to a survey of the place. It was mainly strung along a single dirt road we called Front Street. People said that if war come to us, it would either make Grand Tower or break it. Many an old plug work. <laughs>
Many an old plug workhorse stood at the rail outside Roger's store. Fiddle music whined from the upper windows. Upstairs, we found the room crowded under the yellow tallow light. Mama made for the mourner's bench, where the old women sat out looking on. There were sets already dancing down the room, and another square going at the end with the young kids. But Cass stuck close to Mama. Cass wouldn't mix, and there wasn't anything you could do about it. Mama was still young enough to shake a leg, but Pa wasn't there. Old Aunt Madge Bledsoe made room between herself and an aged country woman named Miss, Mrs. Herod Yancey. It was her whose sister-in-law, Mrs. Champ Hazelrig, was at ate by her own hogs. Mrs. Yancey was old-fashioned even for them days and dipped snuff on a stick to rub on her gums. With a quick nod, Mama settled in with Cass beside her. Noah and me hung at the edges, watching the dancing. There was no shame in partnering with your brother, but it took Noah time to set his mind to it. Mr. Chili Atterbury was in full spate, calling, Bird in, buzzard in. Pretty good bird, and shape she's in. Hands clapped, elbows flapped, and that old sprung floor rolled and heaved. Mr. Chili Atterbury could grow tropical, topical in his calling. Buchanan out, give a shout, Lincoln in, show a shin. People whooped at that and fashioned footwork to go with it. But then he went too far, as he was apt to do when he called. Jeff Davis is a president, Abe Lincoln is a fool. Jeff Davis rides a big bay horse, Abe Lincoln rides a mule. Jeff Davis had just been made president of this new country, the Southerners, the Secesh, thought they'd started up, and Lincoln was our own Illinois man. The Southerners whooped with approval. Cat calls and heavy stomping came from the rest. Mr. Atterbury drew up just shy of a fist fight and fell back on an old faithful Texas star. Gents to the center and back to the bar, ladies to the center to form the star. Now we were in there with them, me and Noah, backing and forthing and sashaying with the rest. I tried to switch my meager skirts and find my place as the star turned to the tune. Then somehow I was across from that young man named Curry Marshall. Now our elbows linked, so I tried to grow light on my feet. I bit my lips to make them pink and tried to simper. But I expect Curry Marshall was looking straight over my head. He was a big, tall galoot, tall as Noah. I don't know how long we all danced until, like the crack of doom, a steamboat whistle split the air. The bow bounced off the fiddle, and everybody stomped to a sudden stop. Right quick, we heard footsteps pounding up the stairs. T.W. Jenkins burst upon us. It's a southern boat. It's the Rob Roy from out of New Orleans. A whoop went up from the southerners and northerners alike. Where's my boys? cried T.W. Jenkins. He ran the freight landing and the store that went with it, the only store we had. There was unloading to be done of whatever was coming off the boat. Noah and Curry Mitchell and three or four others who worked at the freight landing darted forward. Noah brought home the only ready money we had, though Mama thought he worked too close to the river. Everybody ganged down the stairs. We met every boat, and this was a special case. The clammy night air hit us full in the face as the town made for the landing. The Rob Roy blazed with lamplight that lit the water around it. The paddle wheel churned in reverse. The gangplank was already down. I'd never set foot on a big boat. To me, a river boat was a palace. The pair of flaring gold chimney stacks belched flame-colored smoke into the night. Below them, the decks glowed like a gingerbread wedding cake. The Rob Roy was full to the gills with passengers. They must have been Yankees hurrying home in case war trapped them. And there were those people who seemed always on the river, restless travelers. The railings were jammed tight with dark figures. I saw the firefly glow of the gentlemen's cig cigars. I imagine I saw diamonds within the ladies' flowing cloaks and emeralds in their hair. I couldn't picture where they'd come from, where they were going. Did I know enough to wonder? We worked our way forward to see Noah and Curry and the other boys running up the gangplank for the freight. We all waved and waved till the pilot up on the Texas deck bothered to wave back. What a sight it all was, this brilliance in the velvet night. People were crazy to hear the news. They called up to the passengers leaning on the rails. What's it like down yonder? What's conditions at New Orleans? Ports open, someone called back. 
Business as usual, still shipping cotton, but we was boarded and searched at Cairo. We drank it all in and turned over every word. Then, lo and behold, two figures were coming down the plank. Will I ever forget that first sight of them? Two figures, backlit by the boat, come down to us by lantern light. A young lady was in the lead in ballooning crinolines. Heavens, I'd never seen such skirts. Rustling taffeta stretched wide over hoops. Her top part was encased in a cut plush cape with tassels and her bonnet. My stars, I pushed past people aside to get a look at it. A bonnet too dark to make out except for the ice blue satin it was lined with and a whole corsage of artificial violets planted inside next to her face. An enormous satin bow tied beneath her chin and then her face framed with long dark curls beside the violets. Her eyes were large and darkly fringed. Her cupid's bow mouth of a, of a mouth too dark to be as nature intended. She must be from New Orleans. No town between here and there could have produced her. The slant of the gangplank all but upturned her. She clung to the rope with one gloved hand. From the other hung a round hat box covered in elegant wallpaper. She turned back to the young woman behind her. I saw this other... I saw this other one only in silhouette at first. She was narrower, darker, shrouded in a long, clean cloak. In place of a bonnet or a traveling hat, her head was tied up in a bandana. It was of some fine silken material, and the tails of the knot were artfully arranged. Her hands were full of various boxes and reticules. The two of them murmured together. Behind them, a deckhand staggered under a humpbacked Saratoga trunk. At the end of the plank, he very nearly stepped through the young lady's hoops. When he swung the trunk off his back, it lit in the mud. By then, I was standing as close to the young lady as I am to you. She turned right to me. She said, her great fringed eyes grew wide. Come again, I said in a trance. He's drunk, that one. All men are drunkards, and the men on this boat, all of them spit, spit, spit. She pointed back to the Rob boy in case I'd missed seeing it. I stared at her and all the crowd around us stood silent, listening in. Drunk or sober, the deckhand was back up the plank. Now here he came again with yet another trunk. I'd never known anybody with two trunk loads of anything. But no, wait, it was Noah bent under the second trunk. He sidestepped the young lady and almost fell off the plank for looking at her. She noticed him, I believe. But now she turned to address us all. Evidently, the world was her stage. I am meant for St. Louis, but I cannot go on. It is too dangerous there. She sang out, and in her mouth, the word dangerous took on quite a foreign sound. It was true there was unrest up there. On the day Lincoln took his oath of office, a Confederate flag was rung up over the Burt Hole mansion in St. Louis. Confederate flags rose above some of the best houses on Olive Street according to the word we'd had. People said the only safeguard to federal authority in Missouri was the St. Louis arsenal. Soon, people said there'd be blood in the streets. I am, how do you say it, the young lady declared, out of the frying pan and into the fire. What must we all have looked like to her, listening open mouthed to her every word? It didn't seem to displease her. And I was insulted at Cairo. She looked around at us with her great fringed eyes to see how we took this terrible news. Cairo was the last town at the bottom tip of Illinois where the North points a long finger at the South. Insulted, she repeated, me. She dealt her bosom a blow. The Federals, they come on the boat in a swarm like bees. They want to see our papers. They want to count our money. They go through our things. She pointed out her trunks and shook her hat box at us. I was so scared I pushed a scream. Darker than the night, her eyes widened to fill her bonnet. They look at things no man should see, we stirred. And would you believe they take from me my pistol? We caught our breaths. She'd been armed? Hardly more than a toy, a lady's pistol that live in my muff? I am desolated without it. How handy a pistol can be, and mine had a pearl handle. Now we were struck dumber than before. No, we cannot brave St. Louis. She swept a tiny gloved hand back at the other young woman, the silent one. I was meant to pay a visit to my aunt, Madame LeBlanc. Again, the young lady's gaze swept us. 
Madame Blanche LeBlanc, she is known to you? We only gaped silently back, our tongues tied. Was this young lady an actress? I for wondered. I for one wondered. I'd heard about the play acting on the showboats, but surely no performance beat this one. We can it is as if we are nefroge, how do you say shipwrecked? We stay here. Is there a hotel? Transfixed though we were, we'd been watching the young woman behind her too, the darker one. She must be a servant. Was she a slave? The question murmured among us. Was she a slave standing now on the free soil of Illinois? My, how we wondered. You won't care much for the hotel, old aunt. Madge Bledsoe called out. Leave it to Aunt Madge, and she wasn't wrong. We had what we called a hotel for the salesmen and agents coming off the boats. It was even grandly named the St. James, but it was only four rooms over a saloon that sold shine and red eye. And it was said that the bedroom walls didn't reach all the way to the ceiling. No, I wouldn't do for you, someone else said. I looked around. It was Mama with Cass in hand. You could have knocked me over with a feather. Mama rarely spoke out. You ins can come stay with me. It's plain, but there's room. The young lady considered. I can pay, she said. Mama nodded while our worlds listened. Me, I am Delphine Duvall, the young lady said to Mama. And here is Kalinda. She gestured at the figure behind her in the shadow. I'm Mrs. Pruitt, Mama said. Enchanté, Madame, said Delphine Duval. She put out her small hand and Mama took it. I'm Tilly Pruitt, I said, speaking right up. This here's my sister Cass. I had to speak for Cass. She wouldn't say boo to a goose unless it had come back from the dead. Delphine Duval dropped a small curtsy my way and I felt her eyes take me on. I looked past her to the other girl, to Kalinda. Tilly Pruitt, I said to her, putting out my hand, but hers were full, and she didn't nod. I couldn't see her shadowed eyes. Noah was there by now, very red in the face, no doubt, from hauling the freight. That there is my twin brother Noah, I explained, because in the presence of Delphine Duval, he was all eyes and no tongue. But he hefted her trunk back onto his shoulder. Cass and I managed the other trunk between us. As the boat began to move away, churning water behind us, the crowd parted, parted, and off we went. Kalinda was hung all over with parcels and valises. Delphine was only lightly burdened by her hat box. Mama led the way because it was dark as the snake's insides now. I watched the shape of Delphine swaying, sighing hoop skirts, and saw that her slippers had heels as we climbed the devil's backbone heading for home. I couldn't see a moment ahead.